Frustration builds after more violence at a homeless hotel shelter in Denver. Bad news for Republicans who keep having mishaps with their guns at the Capitol. Democrats want to add that building to the list of places you can't carry a weapon. About 100 people will do something tonight that has not been done in Colorado in 40 years. They're essentially going to handpick a new member of Congress. The hardest hole on a golf course has now become the easiest, par five to par three, because of who's living on the links. Yeah, the hole's been basically cut in half. And a word about one of the most depraved things I have ever seen in Colorado politics. Tonight, on Next. It has happened again. Another shooting at Denver's most watched hotel, one of the shelters set up by the city for people who've been living on the streets. The latest shooting comes two weeks after two people were killed there and the city promised better security. Denver police say a woman was injured in a shooting inside a room at the old Doubletree off Quebec and I-70 shortly before midnight last night. Police have taken two people into custody. All of them live there. The mayor's office promised more security at that hotel after two people were shot and killed in a room there earlier this month. The city's adding unarmed guards and new medical metal detectors, promising to check in with each resident every week to see how they're doing. As next first reported here last night, the Salvation Army got $800,000 from the city for security at that hotel shelter that the Salvation Army operates. But they tell us they only used a little bit of that as they spent months researching security options. Our Kelly Rinke is along now with some answers about how the city is going to get this security money back now that taxpayers are paying for the city to provide security. Well, yes. So now that the city is going to be offering security, Salvation Army won't be using those funds anymore. So Denver is now looking to amend that contract to take that $800,000 back. Um, it does not appear that the city right now is looking to change any other agreements with the Salvation Army. Seven deaths have happened at the formal Doubletree this year alone, way more than other hotel sites in that district. Denver Denver's housing department says the Doubletree is a much larger facility, and its director pointed to the fact that the city gets thousands of calls every year for people staying outdoors. It is, you know, our belief that once we get people inside, they are safer. We have people in one location where we can really help provide them support. Yesterday, Salvation Army told us the deaths are a matter of putting problems it used to see at encampments across the city in one area. Councilwoman Chantel Lewis doesn't accept that explanation. Her district has four city-run shelters, while others have one or zero. For months, she's been worried about concentrating poverty in her district, and now she's concerned people aren't getting the resources they need. It's been an eight-month battle of like patience and frustration, and I am devastated and absolutely disappointed that it has taken the loss of life for people to be like, oh, wait, maybe what Councilwoman Lewis was talking about is actually the right approach. Denver's Department of Housing Stability says uh, in addition to the security, they are working with Salvation Army to increase wraparound services at their sites. You understand what they're saying, right? When they say, well, we've concentrated these folks who are dealing with big life traumas in one spot, of course, there are going to be issues. But at the same time, I think people are shaken by the idea of week after week, there yep. being serious violence at this spot. And what Councilwoman Lewis was saying is uh, from someone who has experience being unhoused, she says, you know, it's great that we're getting people housed, but we need to make sure that once they are there, once they have a room, that they get the services they need. She feels that we're seeing all of these incidents because that is not happening. Can't just warehouse people. You got to help people. All right, Kelly Rinke, thank you. Democrats at the state capitol are drastically scaling back their bill, which would have banned concealed carry in most of Colorado's public places. But they've added limitations on carrying guns in one place, the state capitol. The bill would ban open or concealed carry in quote-unquote sensitive spaces. The original version of the bill defined that as the vast majority of public places, parks, community centers, religious buildings, public events with permits, and on and on. Amendments passed last night mean that the bill would only ban firearms at school and college campuses, polling locations, and local government offices or courthouses. The bill's sponsors also added the state capital to the list of sensitive spaces. If this passes, that would keep legislators from carrying concealed weapons on capital grounds. That's right. Legislators can and often do carry weapons at the capital. We have been reminded of that by incidents like 
2014, when Republican Rep Jared Wright left a loaded gun inside a canvas bag in a committee room. 2022, when Republican Rep Richard Holtorf tripped and his gun fell out of his pants. And last year, when Republican Rep Ron Weinberg had two guns stolen from his maybe unlocked truck parked outside the Capitol. About 100 people are going to pick a member of Congress from Colorado tonight. The Republican Party insiders who are gathering in Lincoln County out on the plains to pick their candidate for a special election to fill the seat of Ken Buck, who just quit Congress. That person they picked tonight is almost certain to win in that deeply red district. So let's get to the pick and part. Our Jennifer Meckles is along now from the Lincoln County Fairgrounds in Hugo. And, and Jenny, essentially the choice is pick someone who is also running in the Republican primary seeking a full term in Congress or pick a placeholder to just fill the seat and not put a thumb on the scale of that primary. Yep, those are your two choices, Kyle. Now you asked about the picking part. We're not quite there yet because we're still in the rules part, which we've been in for about 30 minutes now. So until we get to the actual exciting part of the night, let me walk you through why all of this really matters in the context of the other big election happening, the primary election, because whoever gets tonight's nomination will be on the ballot in June, the same day, the very same ballot, in fact, as the primary election for the very same seat. Is that confusing at all? It might be, but it could also be a huge advantage for somebody who maybe gets part of this special election nomination tonight. So take Congressman Lauren Bobert, Bobert for example, who has suggested that the timing of Buck's resignation was a move to hurt her chances to try and replace him. She is not running in tonight's special election. She's not here. She was not likely to get the party's nomination, and if she won the seat, she'd have to vacate her current seat in Congress, and the Republican House majority is just too, too thin. So she has to convince voters to support her in the Republican primary on the same day that they will vote for whichever Republican gets picked tonight to run in the special election. Now, if tonight's committee group picks somebody who's already running against Boebert in the primary, that's a huge boost for them, right? And there are several people who are up for that tonight who are planning to run in the primary and they could have their name on the ballot twice on election day. We're listening for a couple of names closely tonight, a name that we have heard potentially, Jerry Sonnenberg, a Logan County commissioner who is quite popular in this rural district. Kyle, again, we are still in the rules component. You mentioned that about 100 people are gonna make this pick tonight. The actual count is 97. 97 is the number of people who are gonna vote on this tonight. That nominee will need a majority vote. Candidates are gonna be able to give their speeches. Voting will be done in rounds and we'll keep going until we get that majority vote. And the day of the special election, June 25th, the primary election is gonna to be top of the ballot and this vacancy election will be at the bottom of the ballot. Are we all still confused or are we following? Hopefully by now. <laughs> no, you did a great job. I'm following every bit of this. And I hope so. <laughs> heard Jerry Sonnenberg say something on the radio the other day. A lot of Republican insiders think that Ken Buck might have quit Congress when he did to help set up his buddy Jerry to give him an advantage over Lauren Boebert. And Jerry Sonnenberg said on the radio, I don't have the votes to win it on the first ballot. Mm, okay. Well, they're going to get to go through two rounds, and then we'll see what happens. And after that, there's going to be some, some cutoffs with percentages and stuff, which is, can all get very confusing as well. Uh, there are, by the way, nine people, Kyle, who are going to be running here tonight. Seven of them are running for the primary. Two could be a potential placeholder if that's the way this goes. So we'll see. All right. Jennifer Meckles reporting from beautiful Hugo, Colorado. We'll check back in on 9 News at 9 and 10. The thing about covering politics these days is that just when you think that you have seen rock bottom, somebody down there grabs a shovel and starts digging. Like yesterday, when Colorado's most powerful gun rights group taunted a state legislator whose son was murdered in the Aurora Theater shooting. This is not about gun rights. You can advocate for gun rights without being ghoulish. This is about human decency and why the group Rocky Mountain Gun Owners does not have any. This is Tom Sullivan on July 20th, 2012, as he learned that his son Alex was killed in the movie theater where he'd gone to celebrate his 27th birthday. Now State Senator Tom Sullivan. He left his Postal Service job to run for office and push for stronger gun laws. This is not about whether you agree with Tom Sullivan on guns. This is about whether you think that he deserves to be taunted about his son's murder. Rocky Mountain gun owners think so, because when his wife, Alex's mother, Terry, dared to testify for a gun bill, Rocky Mountain gun owners posted, I think Tom Sullivan is going postal. Going postal, as in flying off in a homicidal rage, a reference to the workplace shootings at post offices like the ones where Tom Sullivan once worked. 
taunting the father of a mass shooting victim by suggesting that well, he might become a mass shooter himself. Rocky Mountain Gun Owners thinks there's an audience for that kind of ghoulishness, that it'll help them gain a following, raise money. What a low opinion they must have of gun owners to think that they want to associate themselves with that kind of cruelty. We in the media often mention Rocky Mountain gun owners because of their powerful influence on Colorado politics. Seems we should mention, seems the public should hear that this is an organization that also mocks the parents of murdered children. There are gun rights groups that don't do that. This one does. And I think the public deserves to know. In the way that we're doing it, I have not seen it done. Aurora Water is getting into the farm business, part of a deal to get access to water from Southeast Colorado. And a golf course changes course to protect the visitors on hole number 13. The city of Aurora is buying up thousands of acres of farmland in southeast Colorado, part of a deal to divert more than 7 billion gallons of water out of the Arkansas River each year. But instead of leaving that land to dry out, while city folk use all the water, they've come up with sort of a timeshare system to keep farming that land some of the time. Aurora is about to close on this $80 million deal to buy a 4,800-acre farm in Otero County, southeast of Pueblo. Aurora will only be able to tap the water rights for that property up to three years out of every decade. And they can use more than two billion gallons each time. But in the other seven years of each decade, the land will be used to grow alfalfa and other crops. And Aurora will use some of the profits from the farm to cover the cost of the land purchase. Aurora Water calls it a win-win. It's not the typical buy and dry deal that we often see where agricultural land is taken out of use to get at its water rights. This deal will, allows us to access an uh, interruptible water supply, which is significantly important to meeting our water needs. And it allows us to continue to be a really good partner with the agricultural community and specifically the agricultural community in the Arkansas Basin. So it's going to be like this kind of off and on farm. It's interesting. During the years that Aurora is not using the water, or pardon me, in the years that they are using the water, the farm will not come to a complete standstill. They'll still be employing some farm workers to maintain that land. All of the snow that the Front Range got a couple weeks ago is still making it really tough to get to some places in the foothills. That includes the Idaho Springs Reservoir. You simply cannot get there by road. Our Evan Krugel shows us how engineers are still getting up there to do their business. Winter driving in the Colorado high country often requires all-wheel drive. But if you're planning a trip to the Idaho Springs Reservoir, you'll need a lot of energy and a pair of snowshoes with no open road to the beautiful lake. Unless, of course, you have one of these. Clifford the Big Red Dog is the only way the Clear Creek Sheriff's Office can reach the reservoir right now. Yeah. Something John Kyler has to do every month to inspect the Idaho Springs water supply. It's the only way to get in in the wintertime for us. This trip would be nearly impossible by foot. Yeah, I'm not sure because I would never try that. <laughs> but the snowcat glides over multiple feet of snow with ease. We're pretty much floating on top of the, the soft snow. Because it's a snowcat, it disperses all of its weight over the tracks and has less impact on the snow. So um, where if we were trying to, to uh, walk up here without snowshoes on it, it'd be up to our waist or so. Even with a portable toilet worth of snow to navigate, John makes it to the reservoir in about an hour. All right. Everything here looks good. So Clifford turns around and heads home. An easy trip compared to some of the rescues they had to perform two weeks ago in heavy snow. Yes, it's slow, but we certainly can get in and and uh, rescue people quickly, a lot quicker than it is to, to bring in and move the snow. John says it could be a busy end to the season. It could be, especially with the snow we've got, it's unstable. He's glad he doesn't have to strap on snowshoes or rely on four wheels to get everywhere he needs to go. <laughs> in Clear Creek County, Evan Krugel, Nine News.
spring has sprung in Denver, Colorado with sunshine and 60s today. Now we are tracking a system that's coming our way from California for late in the holiday weekend. And before that system rolls in, a weak weather disturbance will bring snow showers to the mountains tonight and tomorrow. We're tracking the potential for a winter weather advisory for over six inches of snow way up high. Denver might see a rain shower on Good Friday ahead of a mild Easter weekend. Temperatures this afternoon in the 60s above average, but the wind is also starting to pick up ahead of a weather disturbance, which will bring more snow to the high country tonight. A winter weather advisory out through Saturday morning for 6 to 12 inches of snow from Steamboat down to Aspen and into Vail. And that's where that concentration of heavier snow will remain as we see a brief rain shower here on Friday afternoon. Fair skies tonight, beautiful night, partly sunny tomorrow, brief rain shower late in the day, and then off we go. Temperatures in the 60s will drop 10 degrees heading into the evening hours, and your extended forecast shows beautiful weather conditions on Saturday, the chance for rain late Easter Sunday, possibly mixing with snow on a chilly Monday with highs in the 40s. Then off we go to sunshine, 60s, even 70 by next Thursday. Yeah, unfortunately, golf balls uh, get hit at ball speeds well over 100 miles an hour. And that is one way to get an eagle. And no one at this course in Inglewood really wants that. Next. The last hole at Inglewood's Broken Tee Golf Course has ruined many an otherwise excellent score on the day. But now that par 5, hardest hole on the course, is much shorter, much easier. Perfect, in fact, to score an eagle. Our maintenance crew noticed them first six weeks ago, and we began to see them more frequently out here, pulling branches, starting to build their nest. So the male just hopped on the nest, and the female just took off towards towards the WADA. It's kind of baffling why the Eagles chose to nest where they did. It's already pretty tough to be sick of coming out to a golf course and, and having a great time, but when you, you have the backdrop of a couple bald eagles, it makes the round that much more special for sure. And about two, three weeks ago, uh, we began observing that one of the birds was staying in the nest pretty much 24-7. Unfortunately, there's no real way for us to, to verify officially that there is an egg up there. But the fact that now, a few weeks later, there's still birds staying in the nest the majority of the time, it's pretty safe to say they've got some eggs. We want to protect the birds and make sure their nesting is successful. Part of that is to avoid any overhead flying objects that might you know, hit the birds. Unfortunately, golf balls get hit at ball speeds well over 100 miles an hour. It could easily kill a bird. The hole's been basically cut in half. It's a par 5 that's, you know, 550 plus yards, and it's now a par 3 that's only about 175 yards long. Unfortunately, it's made one of the toughest holes on the golf course, one of the easiest. But when you get to see a couple giant bald eagles, you're not too worried about playing a, a par 3 instead of a par 5. We're back here in a moment with your feedback about tonight's commentary. Next. Ooh, the feedback tonight. Uh, Michael says, I don't usually watch Channel 9 News, but did this evening. Said, I want to commend you for the intestinal fortitude. I love that term, your commentary. One rarely sees potentially controversial commentary from the heart. I think it's to the credit of Channel 9 News. I'll watch it more often. What if we normalize the idea of advocating for decency on TV? What if we did that? Don says, thank you for holding both sides accountable, even if that means you're despised by politicians. We serve you, not them. That's the gig. See you next time.